Hi, everyone. Um, thanks again for coming. My name is Grace Mattioli. I'm an author of three books, two of which are novels. One is entitled Olive Branches Don't Grow on Trees. The next one is, the other one is Discovery of an Eagle. And um, I also recently wrote a nonfiction guide book for indie authors. It's called Tell the World Your Story, a super short guide for serious indie authors. It may be of interest to um, some of you out there. And it's available only in ebook format through Kindle, uh, through Amazon's Kindle store, Barnes and Noble's Nook store, Kobo, which is Kobo, um, K-O-B-O. -O. For those of you who aren't familiar, that is the e-reader for Independent Booksellers Association. So that's a really great one. Um, and also it's available on iTunes. And um, anyway, we are actually gonna talk about three topics of writing, publishing, and promoting your books. And I'm gonna speak first, uh, followed by Alicia, followed, followed by Bob. And, um, you know, but feel free to ask questions as we go along. And um, for each topic, it will be 20 minutes. Um, again, feel free to ask questions, but there will be time reserved for the end of the session for questions as well. <clears throat> and also, we'll be selling our books at the end, if you're interested. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say about writing, um, the way that I was able to write two novels in two years while working full time was by being very disciplined and by setting a quota of words to write per day. This worked really well for me. So I set a quota of 400 words. Oftentimes I would exceed that, but I was always sure to make my quota of words. Um, and this is an idea I got from this excellent book called The Nighttime Novelist by Joseph Bates. And I know that lots of you, I'm sure, are nonfiction writers out there. But for those of you who are uh, fiction writers, especially novelists, I can't recommend this book enough. It's been my Bible through writing two books, two novels, and I'm about to start on my third. So that's where I got this idea of having a quota per day. And it's a really great idea because rather than waiting for the inspiration to strike, I just began writing and um, it, it just, uh, whatever. <laughs> it's a really good way to go. Um, the other recommendation I want to make for writing your books, if you're serious about having them published and having more than just your friends and family read them, is to have them professionally edited. So this is, this is essential for um, the uh, book publishing process. And you want to do an edit after you've revised your manuscript several times on your own. And a good edit, um, an edit can cost anywhere of $500 and up, but it's something that I highly recommend. Um, in terms of finding an editor, it's a little bit tricky because there's not like a formal certification that you need to um, become an editor. So I used word of mouth in looking for my editors. And also, I was sure to give them a sample of my work and see how uh, the kind of edits they made on it so I knew if it was a good fit or not. So that's something I, I really highly recommend. And um, you know, it's a little short for the writing session, but I'm going to turn it over to my um, colleague or my my friend, <laughs> um, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Hello. And my thanks to you for the San Francisco Library for hosting us. A, a lovely opportunity. My name is Alicia Young. I'm the author of The Savvy Girl's Guide to Grace, Small Touches with Big Impact at Home, Work, and in Love. It's nonfiction. It's a light read. It's about tapping our inner Audrey Hepburn in a rushed world. I feel like today we're more logged on than ever, but less connected. And so it's about simple ways to bring back those connections. Um, so can I, would you like Bob to introduce himself and I'll come back to writing? How would you like to do it? How do you want to do it? Yeah. How would you want to do it? Um, so mm. anyway, I'm Bob Finlayson, um, or R.A. Finlayson is my author uh, name. Uh, and I wrote a book called Gene Pool on Natural Selection, which is a science fiction novel set uh, 50 years in the future about uh, how biotechnology takes over our lives in essence and what does that mean. 
um, and it's the first in a four-part series. Um, so that's who I am, and if you want to, Alicia, go and speak about sure. writing. Thank you. Okay. Um, a couple of thoughts here. My book took two years to write and about 15 months to independently publish. And I would recommend to anyone who's flirting with the idea of indie publishing, please, oh please, make sure that you are passionate about what you choose to write about. I feel like there's two types of writers in the world, broadly speaking. One are trade writers who can turn on their writing like a faucet on and off. One week they're writing about Alexander the Great, the next they're writing about the mating rituals of sea turtles. <laughs> Good for them. But in terms of, I was so glad that I felt so passionately about writing about Grace. You have to be ready to talk about your book and be grateful for the chance to talk about your book. Talk about it in the street, in a crowd, underwater, in a coma. Be passionate about it. You can call me at 2 a.m., please don't, and I will talk to you about your inner Audrey Hepburn if you so desire. So do, do consider that passion. When I, for me, it was a three-year project, I'm very grateful that I didn't go with my initial topic, which was identity theft and how to avoid it. I would have burst into flames, I would have been so bored. So make sure it's something that you feel passionate about because if you choose to be an independent publisher, not to be flippant, but they do say writing the book is the easy part. When you're tired and you just want to put it down, that's when the work is cranking up, when you've got to sell it and get the word out in a sea of other authors. So it really helps to feel passionate. Uh, I would also encourage you very much to join a writer's group, either in person or online, to have that support. Writing by nature is solitary, for most of us, I imagine. And so getting out there, having the support of other writers, giving them support, learning from each other, I think is a very important part of the creative process. I think I've always learned. We have Elizabeth Fischel here today, an author, and Elizabeth uh, runs a wonderful a series of writers groups in Oakland and I learned very much from that so I would encourage you to look at that as well. Elizabeth, can I just ask you to raise your hand just in case? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And there's some flyers over here as, as well for some events coming up. What I did learn to do when writing my book, one of many things I learned, was the notion of an editor by committee. Now this does not replace professional editing, but with an editor by committee, when you've gone through a few of your drafts, you feel like you're polishing as you go along, consider six people in your life that you would consider reasonably well read and who can be a little objective, i.e. probably not the person who gave birth to you. <laughs> They're just going to love it. But what I would suggest you do is don't give someone your whole manuscript. Just say, take please take a chapter or two and give them a key to market. You know, for example, and I've written this on your handout, um, if you like something, give it a check. If you don't like something I've raised, put a cross next to it. If you're confused, put a question mark. These kind of simple symbols makes, makes it easier when they give you back those chapters to let you see what worked and what didn't. And when they give it back to you, there is only one response we can give, and that is... Thank you. Thank you for finding the time in your day to give me your feedback. This is not a time to get defensive. I cannot believe you did not get that joke. Where is your sense of humour? Just be thankful. Uh, so I think that's important as well. And just if I might make one more thing. I had to make a conscious decision when I set out to write my book. I would not be intimidated by this process. Frustrated, sure. Fatigued, absolutely. I don't drink, smoke, or do fine white powder. I considered starting all of them in this process. But I, I told myself, whatever obstacles I came across, someone else has also come across. And you've got this wonderful community in the Bay Area to plug into. So jump onto message boards, join BAPER, also on your handout, the Bay Area Independent Publishers Association, and you will get answers. People are very gracious in the writing community. That's enough from me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's a lot about writing. Um, it took me three years to write my uh, first novel, and uh, it was a very complex process because it's a science fiction book, and there was a lot of research involved. Um, so I think Alicia's quite right. Passion about your subject matter is really important because uh, when you're up late at night trying to figure something out research-wise, I can't find a fact, um, it helps if you really care about the subject and you're really interested. 
Um, as far as the writing process, I think groups are a really great way to get encouragement. And in fact, um, if I can, my, the group that I was involved with was called Shut Up and Write. Mm -hmm. And Rennie Saunders is here as well, if Rennie <laughs> wants to raise his hand. Uh, it's a great group that's here. Uh, it's actually, we have a number of chapters around the country now. Uh, but the idea is that you just go there and you write for an hour. And if you, if you go there consistently, uh, w once a week for a year, you'll have the first draft of a short novel. Um, and it's amazing how you can get the work done. But uh, as one of our, uh, the, the, the lines that we like to use at Shut Up and Write is uh, something that Isaac Asimov said, who has written, I don't know, 420 some books. Uh, hit, when he was asked, how do you do it? He said, but in chair. And that is, really the, that is really what you need to do. If you want to be a writer, butt in chair. And that's how you have to do it. But going to these groups, and we met in cafes, and it's very encouraging. Just It's kind of like going to the gym, right? Mm -hmm. When you're there, you figure, OK, I might as well work out. If you go to the group and everybody's writing, I might as well write. And you start to write, even if you're just taking notes or you're just writing your ideas down. But just get started. And that's actually the best advice that anyone ever gave me, is that I think a lot of us spend many years not writing the book that we want to write. And the biggest obstacle is, oh, we're not ready. I don't have the right material. Maybe I'm not good enough. I need practice or what have you. Start today is the best advice you'll ever get. It's like start on that book immediately. Don't wait. Um, the editing process is, 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 the, is uh, the joy for me was writing the book, right? And then I spent another probably eight months editing it myself. Um, and you really need to do that because when you go back, you'll reread material. I like to read things aloud because I think you're, sometimes you hear what, what you can't read on the page, um, and, then, and then giving it out to some folks whose opinions you value but who are willing to tell you the truth. Yes. And giving small sections of it, agree with that too, because you don't want to force people to read the whole thing. Let them have a bit and go, you know what, hey, this is great, I'd like to see more, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, and see how that goes. And then do get someone who is either a professional editor or a very good editor to do a final edit on your book before, uh, before it goes out. Um, so basically, in, in terms of writing, uh, the only other advice I would give is if you're, my, my book has a four interweaving plot lines, uh, and I found it very useful to sort of architect that on a wall where I wrote out, I tend to write in scenes, write scene by scene, and then put those up, each, each scene is described on a card, and then you tape them up on the wall, and you're like, does the plot flow? And it gives you a, a real chance to correct errors before you start sitting down to write the book um, and, and eliminate a lot of problems that you run into, not that you still don't run into them. Uh, and finally, I'll say, it's good to know the beginning and the end of your book, if you're writing a novel, right? So, and that way, because it's like, it's a trip, right? You know where you're going, now you just have to figure out how to get there. Um, I should add, hi again, everybody. So now we're going to talk about the publishing process. So there, there will probably be um, more time spent talking about the publishing and the promoting aspect than the writing aspect because um, naturally there's, there's so many books on writing a book. So um, anyway, I'm going to start with the publishing process. I would recommend, um, or I'd like to strongly recommend publishing in both ebook and paperback formats simultaneously. That's what I did for my second book. And the reason you want to do this is to give the potential buyer as many formats and choices as possible. So, um, so in publishing in my, um, in ebooks, the other recommendation in an ebook format, the other recommendation I would make is publishing um, in Amazon KDP, which is Kindle Direct Publishing, and Smashwords. And Smashwords is a really great, um, it's a distributor, the largest distributor for independent ebooks. So once you publish through Smashwords, they will make your book available in Nook, Barnes & Noble Nook Store, um, iTunes, Kobo, and, um, God, am I escaping another format? I'm sorry, I can't think. But um, they'll also make them available in, um, so the you know, major ebook formats besides Kindle. And they'll also make them available in various uh, databases that are used by libraries, such as OverDrive and Access 360. 
So it's a really good deal publishing through Smashwords. Um, with KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, um, I, I did that as well. Um, now, it's a little tricky because Amazon has a program, and many of you probably heard of this, called KDP Select. And KDP Select uh, requires authors to only publish their book in Kindle format. So Amazon says, no, you can't publish in Nook or uh, iTunes or any of these other. You can't have your ebook in any of these other formats. But the trade-off is they will let your, they have this program, that's what it, uh, KDP Select is, is a program whereby your book can go free for five days out of every 90 days. So what this does is it boosts your ranking because you get to promote your book on tons of sites, so you get to reach thousands of readers. The disadvantage is that, again, you can't publish on these other sites then. You can't have your book available in any other formats. And um, so you're exclusively on Amazon. So you're only reaching a certain uh, audience. And I, it's not something, it's something I did for my first book, and it did help my ranking, but there's, there's a lot of negatives to it, and mainly the exclusivity really kind of limits your exposure. And I felt like the whole thing with becoming, or with, you know, with publishing my book is, I want to expose myself and I want to get out there as much as possible. I want to get my name out there as much as possible. And that's part of why I kept my books really cheap. So I sold my first ebook for $1.99 and the second one's priced at $2.99. And I really strongly advise that because people are reluctant to shell out for a big name author today, you know. And so I feel like, well, as an unknown author, I should just. I, give them every incentive I can to want to buy my book. So um, so the other thing I was going to discuss um, was the publishing in the paperback format. <clears throat> Unless anybody, does anybody have questions about the KDP or um, about Smashwords? Yes. It goes, it goes into databases that libraries use. One is called Overdrive, and, the, and one is called Access 360. And there may be other ones as well. I'm sorry, could you say? You don't get any more money for, like, for that? No, so you just, get more exposure. just more exposure. Okay. But it's a really great way to, to, get your, to get your name out, to get known. Um, it's Smashwords was really reasonable to publish on, so I just paid $40, and that was to have somebody convert my, um, not to convert it into a Mobi format. That's, I, I did that on my own. That's what you have to do for when you're publishing on KDP. But um, it was just $40 to have it formatted in such a way that they accept it into what's called the premium catalog. And when they accept it into the premium catalog, it's available that's when they make it available in all those stores, in Nook and iTunes and so on. But so it's really cheap. No, I get that. Do they, do I, but I don't know. I'm still confused. Do they take any part of the price, of the retail price? It's, I forget the percentage now, oh, it's but small. it's, yeah, it's, okay. it's something like Kindle. It's, mm, well. I, I am so bad at keeping track of any of that stuff <laughs> because, again, I just, I mean, my whole prerogative was to really just expose myself and get, make a name. But um, anyway, I wanted to talk about um, the uh, paperback publishing aspect of, of, um, of publishing. And um, in doing that, uh, and as, you, as many of you probably all know, uh, the two leading uh, venues are CreateSpace, which is an affiliate of Amazon, and Ingram Spark, which is an affiliate of Ingram, which is the largest book distributor in the country. And um, sometimes Ingram Spark, when I first found out about it, um, it's also known as Lightning Source. So you may have heard it referred to as Lightning Source as well. <clears throat> but um, I published my first book in 2012 with Create Space, and I just I brought in um, copies of it so you could kind of see the difference. And um, so 
I revised it in 2014 and I republished it or had it reprinted with Ingram Spark. And I was much, much happier with the Ingram Spark copy because it, it looks just a lot more professional. It looks like I see a lot of books as a librarian. I forgot to mention in the beginning, I'm a librarian here, 18 years. <laughs> so I see, I see many books um, coming through my way. And um, this particular, this copy of All the Branches of Growing Trees looks like many of the other self-published books that I see, whereas this other copy looks like um, as good or as professional as any books I see coming out of New York. So I, I had a better experience overall with Ingram Spark. So it might seem like a no-brainer to you, I'll go with Ingram Spark. But um, the thing with CreateSpace is they really do a lot of hand-holding. And so, for instance, um, with CreateSpace, I didn't have to worry about formatting my book or having it professionally formatted or getting an ISBN um, number. Um, because they, they pretty much held my hand through the whole process. Uh, Create Space ended up costing me more and, than the Ingram Spark copy did, even with getting it professionally formatted and having to buy an IESBN number. <clears throat> so, um, but either either company is great. I just I just had a better experience with Ingram Spark. Uh, they are a little bit. Um, trickier to use. Again, they're not as um, easy, user-friendly as CreateSpace. So that's um, a possible disadvantage. Anyway, uh, thank you. Is there Are there any questions before? Yes, sir? Um, I, I was just wondering, you when you talk about putting something into print, like what, what is your primary motivation for actually having paperback hard print? Oh, good question. And I forgot to address this. The other thing um, that where create space is really at a disadvantage is it was impossible for me to get this into bookstores. It was possible for me to get it into libraries because I know as a librarian, most libraries use what's a uh, Baker and Taylor database and maybe half, I'm, I'm not sure, but I shouldn't say most, but just about all bookstores use Ingram. And so not only could I not get it into the Ingram database, but I also, um, the also the other things that they require that Ingram Spark will allow you to do is they um, make your uh, book available at a discount, and they make it fully returnable. And bookstores require this in getting your book into them. So anyway, in answer to your question, I didn't mean to be circuitous, but my prerogative, my main prerogative, was getting into bookstores and libraries, um, and just thereby increasing. Uh, exposure to my book. No, it's not like your your print work is fueling your income. No, I'm caught. <laughs> I mean, yeah, my royalty checks added up to less than a thousand dollars. They they're not they're nothing, you know. So I never, and I never looked at it as that I'm going to make a living this way. No, I but mean, it's it's almost but, like it, we're at the day and age where it's sort of like why have anything that's actually physical anymore. You know, right, is, is but you can't get them into you can't again you can't get them into bookstores and libraries. You can actually you can get them into libraries because they have databases, but um, you can't have them like say somebody wants to put it out in their staff pick section or something. A bookstore clerk. Well, I, I, I mean, could, it seems to be a, a desired format. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Theoretically, you could have an electronic staff pick. Right. But people don't necessarily think. They might terms. not use it as much. And I just, I know from my field that I'm in, there is kind of a little bit of a, there's getting to be a shift back towards uh, print books. And I, I prefer them myself. So I'm very comfortable with e-formats, but I prefer, I prefer print. This, this is getting in a prom the promotion aspect. Uh -huh. How do you promote an oh. e-book? That's the next I mean, you can, okay. you can do writer events <laughs> at bookstores with a yeah. physical book. How do you promote an e-book? There's, there's so many ways. So, um, okay. wow. We okay. can get into that That's in a minute, a good, maybe. Big question. But we will get into that. And also, um, um, I do get into that extensively in my Tell the World Your Story book. Um, but uh, there's, there's so many venues for uh, promoting 
your book is an ebook. Um, so do you think that there are more venues as an ebook than as a physical? Print there book? are, but here's the thing. I I think that I'm not sure how. For um, there. I'm not sure how good, like, I do all the social media, I'm on all the sites, and I do, you know, I do as much as possible, and I have my website, and my blog, and I, I blog every week, and I do everything possible, but um, I'm going to get into this a little more in the promoting, but I may as well bring it up now. Um, I, I met a man who, I was sitting on the beach, and he came up to me and started pitching his book, and it was an amazing book, and, but this guy had an amazing pitch that was incredible. And um, so we st started talking. He told me, he's an indie author, he told me in five years he sold 5,000 books just by going up to people on the beach or in the cafe. And to me, nothing takes a uh, place of word of mouth. There's many venues for, and there, there's many ways for selling your book online, but I, I'm a big believer of word of mouth but um but yeah we're going to get into that a little more when we get into the promoting aspect but um did you have a question is spark uh exclusive are they mutually exclusive spark and create space can you be on both no i mean i'm sorry i shouldn't have answered that so quickly i'm not sure uh why would you want I, I don't know why you'd want to though. Yeah. Um yeah, I I don't know. I couldn't see why not, actually, but I just um Yeah, and I'm not sure if it would really be beneficial. And then also you'd have to have um I think it might be really confusing to the audience because then if you're getting like reviews for your books, um You'll, you'll have two different editions because you're going to have the one that Create Space used their ISBN and then the other one where um, you get an ISBN from Balker or one of the identifier services. So, I yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing that. But I mean, I did I do have these two published by the different by the two different um, ones. But this that's because this one is revised. Are they still um, both available? They are, but this one's dying out. Um, it's really weird. It took Amazon the longest. Um, so Amazon still might, I, I don't know, they're still, they still have it on their site. So on my website, I have a link directly to this copy on Amazon. But um, on all of the other sites, when I put in all the branches don't grow on trees, on Barnes and Noble or anything, this, this one comes up. So it's a, it's a little tricky. And, but I really want it to, yeah, it is, it is. But I'm going to turn it over, um, and, and we will get back to promoting uh, ebooks, methods of promoting ebooks. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank Thanks, you. Dave. Thank Thanks. You. In terms of publishing, it's very helpful to ask early on: Is this going to? Is this book going to be a hobby or a profession? And I don't mean perhaps your only source of income. One would hope not initially because it does take time, even with the best publicists. Mm -hmm. But ask yourself, is this a hobby or a profession? Are you looking at doing a family memoir where your only audience, as enthusiastic as they are, is your relatives at the next summer family reunion? Because that will help determine how much money, resources and energy you want to invest in this project. You would still, I would still encourage uh, professional editing. I think that's non-negotiable. But it does bring it into focus if your audience is, say, 50 or 70 people versus wanting to hit the bestseller list, for example. So whether it's a hobby or a profession is something to consider early on. I would also, in the, in the publishing phase, or as early as possible, join a group like BAPA, the Bay Area Independent Publishers Association. It's on your handout. Also, again, you have this wonderful community in the Bay Area, and I would heartily recommend that you join the California Lawyers for the Arts. It's all of, I believe, 30 or $40 a year, fantastic workshops for creative artists, and I, I really would recommend that. I also, I believe they still offer the, the service whereby if you join, if you need one, you can get uh, a short free appointment with a, an attorney, for example, in, an, an intellectual property attorney, if you need to check copyright issues and things like that. Um, in terms of, in, the thing about independent publishing, I feel, is the good news is there's no one to say no. <laughs> 
The bad news is there's no one to say no. And so what I mean by that is it's incumbent upon us to, to be, make an assessment of our strengths and weaknesses and say, you know what, I'm pretty good at this. I can do research to bring myself up to speed on that, but I really need help with this particular thing. And then you're in the position, if your budget allows, as time allows, to bring in professional input as, you know, as your project allows for it. There's several things that I've learned along the way. Let me stress, I am not a lawyer. Let me repeat that in America, I am not a lawyer. But when I uh, interview someone, I get them first off to sign a release. And again, it's in your handout, but there's certain phrases I've learned to use that I ask for an agreement saying that if I hire a book designer, for example, that I own the copyright to the work that she produces for me. I also added that um, she retains portfolio rights so that she can, you know, if someone designs a book for you, I think it's reasonable that they can put it on their website and use it as part of their portfolio. I think that's good faith. But then usually there are no royalties or other residuals that are paid. Once I pay someone, I like it to be a final payment with thanks, and then I'm not having to accrue royalties. It's an accounting nightmare um, after that. The two things I would never skimp on ever in book publishing is the professional editing and the cover of your book. Now, if, you're, if you have a graphic arts bent, by all means, give it a try, and you may find you, you, you love what you do and that you get good feedback with it. But just be careful about that. They're the two things I would try not to skimp on and I would put off my project to be able to afford those things. Uh, what else, are, in terms of getting the page layout, I had someone do that. There are people who are very talented with do-it-yourself. Alas, I am not one of them. And so I would go to associations like editorial, associations, copy editor associations, who have a code of conduct, have a, um, a certain skill set that I'm after, and I feel that those people tend to keep up through their own communities, their professional development about the newest things happening in their editing areas. So I think that's important. Some questions to ask an editor when you're looking out. What is your experience in my genre? If your editor could be great on fiction, but if you're wanting to do non-fiction and there's a, there's a whole other art to that, then perhaps you don't want someone cutting your teeth, cutting their teeth rather, on your non-fiction book. So, you know, what is your experience in this area? What, experience, what feedback can I expect from you? If you're a developmental editor, how much feedback am I going to get? In what manner? How much detail are we going to get into? Would you consider... Uh, looking at one or two pages of my work and giving feedback on that. Do you edit only in track changes or are you open to doing hard copy editing, which some people prefer? So you know, again, what are your payment terms? Do you work per word, per hour, as some do? Or do you do a flat fee up to, for example, 50,000 words? And if you do a flat fee, how many passes do I get at this before you start charging me? And at that point, what do you charge me? It's just really good to not get a nasty surprise with a bill later, and I'm sure they would agree as well. One thing I do notice with independent books is that sometimes, not often, but sometimes the author photos look halfway to mug shots. I mean, they're just shocking. It's basically, you know, all they're missing is the, is the sign with their number, you know. But I do also appreciate that having a professional photograph can be very expensive. And what, what, one thing I did was to go to a film school. I contacted a film school in New York, and within 15 minutes, they posted an ad for me saying, you know, author photo wanted, photo shoot, etc. We negotiated a flat rate. Again, she retained portfolio rights. I retained the copyright to my photos so I can use them anywhere. Mm -hmm. And she gave me a lovely photo that I was happy to use. Now, I did something a bit extravagant, which I no wouldn't normally do. I once booked two photo sessions in two days in New York. One was with, and I apologise to any professional photographers here, but I booked a professional photographer, <coughs> and she was, whatever happened that day, she was a little bit tense and uptight, which made me tense and uptight. When the photos came out, I looked like human taxidermy. <laughs> 
Like the, I was like the meerkats in the National History Museum. It was shocking. Whereas the other girl was casual and laid back. So I was casual and felt better about it. So if you want to book a photographer, however you do it, perhaps meet with them before you book them and just get that feeling because this is something you're going to want to use for a while. And I went to, I looked at booking a professional photographer and it was, you know, $1,000, $2,000. So I could get my head around that but they wanted another $2,000 for one copyright to my own face. And I thought, I don't know about that. I would like to use this photo, it's me in it. Now, I respect that not every photographer does that, but that was when I was calling around a year or so ago, that seemed to be the norm in New York. So there are options through using film schools and things like that, just consider that as well. Um, and finally, in terms of publishing distribution, if I might say, there's so many platforms, as Grace mentioned, to once your book is done, to get it distributed across different platforms like Amazon. And Amazon, of course, is this giant in the publishing industry. And this is where I envy my fiction writer friends. When I, my book is only available at the moment in the US. Now, if I was a fiction writer or perhaps a memoirist, I might be able to tick, when it comes to it, all the different, um, to make my book available across all the different countries that Amazon makes their books available. But as a non-fiction writer, I've got to be careful that the fair use laws where I've quoted a song or I've quoted someone else's work, the, the fair use laws in the US may are very different to the ones in London. Mm -hmm. So just be careful about it. Just consider, and again, another reason to go to the California Lawyers for the Arts, just get it sussed out. And don't get excited and, and choose every country on earth because it might come back to bite you. So just be aware of that. Thank you. Yes. Very good. Um, so we've covered a lot of ground. Um, see if I can add a, a little bit to it as far as publishing goes. Um, I'm actually a firm believer in ebooks. Um, I think there is a place for printed copies. Um, it's very hard to get bookstores to pick up uh, an indie book uh, unless you go around and kind of personally do some hand selling. Um, and the ebook world is, in, from the numbers, and I'm a technologist, so. Uh, is really exploding. So there's a lot of opportunity there to get your, your book out and it's far more cost effective. Um, there, there's a, there are a number of platforms. Frankly, um, I would say probably 85% of my sales have come through one and that's Kindle. So it's the biggest platform by far. Barnes and Noble is trying really hard but they're still way behind um, and, and Kindle just, they, they practically control the ebook market. Mm -hmm. So you just want to make sure that your book is formatted properly for the Kindle and that it looks beautiful there. Um, the two things that, you, that are really important in this day and age of publishing is even if you're going to do a printed copy is your cover art is really critical. And the reason is because, so this is the cover of my book and when I originally, I had a professional artist do it, I thought, oh, it's just too simplistic. But what happens is, and the reason why, is because when this gets squinched down to a thumbnail on that website and people are looking through it, they cannot see the fine details on your beautiful cover. So you want to keep it simple and bold. Mm -hmm. So that way, because that is your sales tool right there, is, that, is that, um, that little thumbnail. And then your author photo is important too. And why is that? Because we just love to see who wrote the book we're yeah. going to buy, right? It's a so, connection. And it really is a connection. It's very important. So you want to, I wouldn't spend $1,000. I think you can probably find a good art student who can do a job yes. uh, for a couple of hundred mm -hmm. uh, and take a nice author photo of yourself that should be representative of you as the author of that book. Um, so, as far as editing goes, a professional editor is critical, as we mentioned before. I think interviewing them, having them test out, like try a, a sample of your work and see how it goes, making sure they, they understand your genre, because it's quite different to end, especially editing nonfiction versus fiction. There's many, many different considerations, so make sure your editor is ver very knowledgeable about whatever, whichever area you're in. Um, and I think and that's probably, do, uh, any other questions on publishing before we move on to promotion? Please. Um, so right now in the science world, there's this idea of open source publishing. So basically it's the idea that if you're writing about anything scientific, it should be open to the public for free. Um, but the sort of writing is that you're talking about sort of a combination of creative scientific writing. So how does that sort of fit into the publishing? 
spectrum is out there as yeah. far as. I mean, this is a big debate, if I might. I mean, about mm -hmm. this, um, there's a lot of open source talk, and it has a, a lot of it has to do with code, you know, programming. Um, but as far as writing goes, uh, it, and this is the same thing happening in the music field too. If no one's going to pay, no one's going to do. So mm -hmm. it's very simple. If authors can't get paid for their work, then they're not going to do it. Or you're certainly not going to have professional people doing it in a professional way. I think that an author deserves to be paid mm -hmm. at a fair rate. And we didn't talk about pricing. And just to add a little bit about that, um, so there is a big price range out there. My book is um, 747. Um, and, that, and I haven't actually reduced the price since I published it several years ago. Uh, it is up for probably going to reduce it um, soon. Um, but yeah, the $1.99 price point, or $1.97, seems to be a really good spot to be. Um, and that, that is not an unreasonable, for someone who puts two or three years into a project, mm -hmm. um, I, that is not an un, unreasonable amount of money in my view to take. I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about the open source issue. Well, one of the things I noticed is on Amazon, you can do a quick scan of chapters of a book, and that's free. That's usually oh, oh that's that's, that's a feature of yeah, that's a feature of Amazon. So every you have to agree to that. We probably should have said when you um, unless you do through a, do it through a third party, if you do direct, uh, you have to sign an agreement with. I have an agreement with uh, the iBooks, with Barnes and Noble, and with Amazon, and that agreement has seven pages of terms and conditions. And one of them, for example, with Amazon is you must authorize them to allow the, uh, at least one chapter of your book to be available for at no cost. Um, but look at those terms and conditions carefully. And I love the group that Alicia mentioned. I think they would be excellent in, firm, in terms of advice. But you, you have no choice, really. You can't alter the terms and agreement, but it's good to be knowledgeable about them. You can choose to, in, on all of those platforms, you can tick off what territories you want to be in. I ticked off the maximum, and I actually had some sales in Poland, the UK, and in uh, you know some other another country that I was like, wow, that's in Italy, and I was like, how do I don't, and it wasn't, it was all in English, so they're they're buying in English. So, anyway, I'm sorry, did you? I think one of the choices on Kindle, and I'm wondering if any of you ever tried this, is for free, make the whole book. Oh yeah, free. And I've heard that it, it could be a good way to launch a book and get it out there, get the word out there. But of course, it's a limited period of time. Have any of you tried that? That's what I was um, yeah, discussing before. And the um, KVP Select is the name of the program. Well, so no, I think Kindle will do it. I'm not a perma free. Yeah. There's a perma free option, too. Mm -hmm. I think so. I, so I didn't choose KVP. I didn't choose Select. Right. Because so I, I have smash words. I, it got too confusing. I yeah. just wanted to oh, keep right, it simple. Right. Um, yeah, there's something called uh, perma-free, so that's usually if you have a couple books. So I've contemplated putting my first book on as perma-free, which would make it um, permanently free on all the sites. But I just worth noting, um, you can't uh, put it free on, say, Nook, or and then not fr you'll get a threatening letter from Amazon if it's a dollar ninety nine on Amazon and it's free on Nook. Um, I don't think it works the other way around. But I was, but, I was thinking yeah. just free for a limited period of time, not free permanently. Yeah, the free days that Amazon has. The free days that Amazon has, that's the KDB Select program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to be oh, in well, the KDB Select. Well, I guess I lost in the website. Because I yeah, it's okay. So, yeah, and, and again, to... It's the author do, choosing that. It's if, not you as the purchaser choosing it. The author can choose Yeah, I'm the author, and I'm oh, the publisher. Okay. I publish a book. Yeah. And I've been at this on the web for months, and I thought one it, of my um, options... And I didn't choose it, uh -huh. but I had actually. I think there were three, which is I set the price, uh -huh. uh, or or the the, the uh, purchaser can set mm -hmm. a price, or the author publisher can make it free for a limited period of time. And I just set my own price. I didn't want to deal with the other two. Yeah. So if if you do choose to participate in that program again, you can't have your book available in any other ebook right. formats. But it's five days out of every ninety mm -hmm. day period that you can let your book go free. Select. Yeah, for select. Right. And mm -hmm. it's a it's a good option because it provides a lot of exposure. Yeah, a lot yeah. of exposure. Okay. So everybody, we're going to move on to the promotion aspect and probably the most um, important aspect or the one that you're most interested in <laughs> aspect of the program. Um, okay, so the first thing I'd like to say is that when I, um, one thing I did for both of my books is I wrote a business plan, and I strongly advise you doing that because if you don't, you may miss many uh, go uh, golden opportunities. And 
I organized my business plan into three phases, pre-publication, publication, and post-publication. So things I did in the pre-publication phase, the most important of which was to solicit reviewers for reviews. This is um, the most important thing I think that I did in any of in writing any of my books, and it's something I did very, very aggressively and tenaciously. And I solicited maybe um, a couple hundred for my first book, and I came back with 20 people saying that they would review it, and maybe five or 10 out of that saying actually reviewing it. So um, the reason I emphasize this is uh, you can get reviews from your friends and family, but as a book selector, I can tell the difference. I can tell when somebody's mom is writing a review and when somebody who's writing an objective, honest review, especially when they state it in the review. This author gave me a copy of a book be, uh, in exchange for an honest review. And also um, what will lend to the person's credibility is if they have a, if they're running some type of book blog or if they're a really established um, book reviewer, uh, such as Midwest Book Review, which is the most established book reviewer for independent writers. So if you can get a book review from them, that's, that's awesome. That's really great. Um, but getting, getting your book reviewed by people and having them uh, post the reviews on Amazon is really important. And I wouldn't do any kind of paid reviews unless it was from Kirkus or Publishers Weekly. Because anybody else that's offering you a paid review, um, you know, you, you want somebody, if you're going to pay money for a review, you want someone that book selectors are going to recognize. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, getting paid reviews from these credible sources is fine, as long as, you know, just don't pay some, some guy, on, I don't know, just don't pay anybody, though, for a, a paid review, for a review, excuse me. Anyway, in my um, book, Tell the World Your Story, I list a couple of really great sites where indie authors can find book reviewers. So um, <clears throat> that's, again, can't emphasize the importance enough. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is having an effective author site. So my... Um, Getting an author website, I recommend using, uh, well, of course, do it on your own if, you know, if money is an issue. I did my first one on my own. Um, my second one, I had designed professionally by a company called Electric Reads. They're out of London, and I highly recommend them. They're, uh, so they're special, they specialize in uh, doing author websites. An effective author website should contain, most importantly, a page on your books with a summary and links to your uh, purchasing your books from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and so on. It uh, should also contain an author biography, a blog which you should update consistently. Um, I don't update my blog as much as I'd like to because of time constraints. I started off once a week, and now I do once every two weeks, but I've been doing it consistently for um, four years, three or four years. So it, the important thing is to keep up with it, not to blog a bunch and then just stop. So um, the other things that should be contained on your website are contact information, a way to con for your readers to contact you, and a link for uh, something like a newsletter so you can collect email addresses. That's really important so that when you write your next book, you have a list of email addresses to send um, notifications or to. Um, so they have programs such as MailChimp or Constant Comment is another one that you might want to check into in terms of getting your own um, newsletter widget. Um, the other thing is a media kit is really important. And I use a media kit in soliciting bookstores and libraries to buy my book. And a media kit consists of the following. A press release, review excerpts, and again, the more established a review source, the better. So if you have Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, um, Midwest Review, anything like that, or 
an established book blog review site. That's great. Um, a book excerpt. A lot of people use the first uh, few pages. Um, I did that for my first book. For my second book, I used uh, a part in the middle. So it's, you know, it's all up to you. Uh, also a biography, a list of publications, and um, a description of your target audience. So it's really important to, to not say that it's kind of the kiss of death if you say, oh, my book is for everyone and anyone can, will enjoy my book. And maybe that's true, but it is good if you can be defined somewhat um, in terms of your target audience. So you kind of know who you're selling to. And um, another really important bit of advice is to, and this is hard for a lot of um, artists because it's not our nature, I think, as artists, but to really think of your book or your product as, I mean, your book as a product. I had to learn to think of my book as a product and not, not as a piece of my soul. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, the other thing is I wanted to answer more, um, a little more extensively. You asked about uh, promoting your book, your eBooks. And there's, there's so many ways to um, just create an online presence, social media, obviously. And there's, you know, um, many ways to acquire followers and so on and different kinds of etiquette that, to learn to do on Twitter. For instance, don't exclusively, your tweet shouldn't exclu uh, be consist exclusively of you promoting your books. Um, also, there's things like giveaways. There's what's called a blog tour. And I did a blog tour with my first book. And that's an, I went to these different, I solicited different book review sites and asked them if I could do an interview on their, um, an interview or a guest blog post or a giveaway which is like you're giving your book away for a little contest. So, um, so these are some really great ways to increase your exposure. Also, there's radio interviews, and there's um, uh, your website is very important. So you're, you should make your website as visible as possible. A lot of authors make the mistake of getting a book, putting it up on Amazon, and, and that's it. But really, you want to be directing people to your site, not to Amazon. Mm -hmm. So that's a really important thing to remember. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia. Thanks, now. Grace. <laughs> Thank oh, unless you. there's any questions. I'm Why sorry. We, maybe we should hold those to the end. OK. OK, got it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. The first thing that comes to mind when the, the promotional part of your book comes up, the marketing part, is that the marketing really is a marathon and not a sprint. So please don't put pressure on yourself to crack four figures in your first week or month. It took me a year to sell over a thousand books. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, some things to do is, my, my colleagues are very au fait with the high tech side of things, so I'll go a little low tech to try to balance that. Enter your manuscript or your completed book in as many awards as you can. It's on your handout, thebookdesigner.com. Joel Friedman has a great link on all manner of book awards that you may not be aware of that you could be eligible to submit. Some of them accept a manuscript as opposed to a published book. So get it in there as quickly as possible, have others review it, and then tweet or go on social media that you've been, you know, you're proud to announce, or you're grateful to share that you've been made a finalist of some sort, or maybe you've won. And these are ways to plant seeds in the minds of your potential buyers. The other thing I would consider doing is going to radioguestlist.com radioguestlist.com is a free service to join. Now, there are fairly small radio markets and podcasts who will contact you, but they basically say, hey, we need someone to talk about dealing with cancer in the family, or someone who's been to India in the last 10 years and wants to talk about the changes, any manner of topics. Again, fairly small audiences, but a wonderful opportunity to practice a radio interview and the fact that it's a dialogue and it's kind of punchy and conversational. A couple of tips on radio. My background is TV and radio. Mm -hmm. When you do a radio interview, even if you do it at home, stand up. Your breath placement is naturally going to be better. 
If you need some notes, print them in very large font and stick them on your door or your kitchen cabinets so that you're looking at them and not looking down. Don't worry about having to hammer your book title all the time. They will intro you and outro you. Oh, today we're talking with Grace Mattioli, author of Olive Branches Don't Go on Trees. Hey, Grace, what's going on? Then they'll outro you. That was Grace Mattioli, Bob Finlayson, at the end of the interview. Another crucial part of publishing is your website, which Grace has already touched on. It is not negotiable. You need your own website. Occasionally we hear an, uh, these arguments come up in the community, oh, don't need a website anymore. There's all manner of social media platforms that you can plug on. Why bother with your own corner of cyberspace? We see social media by nature is fluid. Every other month there's a hot new site that you have to join. Now those terms and conditions can change at any time. You could be coasting along beautifully on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, and then maybe they always have the option to change their terms and conditions. By nature, your website is a form of insurance. It's that little corner of the world where people can always find you. Your store is open 24-7. They can learn about you, read your bio, get a feel for you, make a connection, and then also find out about your other services. For example, New authors, and I put myself among them, often think that our first book is the, the be all and end all. <laughs> and in fact, what I've done in the last few years is open up other things like a speaker platform. Where, so consider that you might want to, to speak to community groups, corporations, colleges about what makes you an expert in your field. Whenever I do speaking engagements, paid or unpaid, I always look for the option to sell what's called back of the room sales. And that's another way to get it out. I always have marketing material, and I'm just conscious of time, but if I can just spend a moment on this. Um, for example, as authors, is, you'll find uh, on your seats, there's a couple of samples here for postcards. Now, one of them has my book title and my photo. On the back is a bit about me and my book. The other side is blank. I then label, put address labels on that. I send this out to a couple of hundred radio stations and I got a very good return on local radio stations across the country saying, hey, we could talk about that. And it's free publicity. That brings me to another point, which is your domain name. You must have a clear domain name because in radio, people only get to hear your domain once. In a magazine or a newspaper or a twice website, if you're lucky. twice if you're lucky. So it's got to sound right. For, for a year or so, I had to hobble along with this awful website, which was not savvylife.com, savvy-life.com. It was really clunky to say on radio. So eventually, I kept an eye out, and savvylife.net eventually became available, and I was able to get that. Something else I would encourage in terms of promotion, own your name if you don't already. If your name is Jane Doe, please own janedoe.com. I didn't, and I paid for it. I noticed that my blog was suddenly skyrocketing in Barcelona, of all places, and I'm thinking, this is kind of great. <laughs> and then I realized there was another Alicia Young, and God bless, she is known as the boob blogger. <laughs> I, three million hits. She puts a picture of her girls on every day. And that's it. So I was getting these awful letters from dirty old men in Barcelona who were thinking they were writing to the boo blogger. Had I been able to, uh, to, to um, own my domain name, I might have had a bit of a better branding opportunity. And finally, when I when my book came out, <laughs> I got excited and I sent out my book to leaders in my field. And now I talk about being savvy and graceful. So I sent it out to people like Hillary Clinton, uh, Michelle Obama, Sandra Day O'Connor, the reti retired Supreme Court Justice. I got lovely letters back from all these ladies, but I made a classic mistake. What I should have said was, please enjoy my book. Please supply me with one tip on savvy living. Just one tip. They were going to write back anyway. These are women of incredible upbringings. They were always going to write a thank you note. But imagine if each of them had said, hey, uh, Michelle Obama has a wonderful agenda on healthy living. I'm sure she would have said, hey, thank you for your book. Um, you know, I would never flatter myself to think she actually read it. But thank you for your book. And I would encourage everyone to limit the drive through to twice a month. Now, what I could have done with all these little insights was cobble them together 
And I, I know I could have got that into a feature magazine or into a supplement of a weekend paper. And so just think about that. If you're going to give it away, think about asking for just something small in return, like a small tip. If you're doing a book on leadership, what's your, what did you learn from your first boss? What's the best or worst thing about leadership? Give me a little bit back and I can use that. Thanks for your patience. Um, well, I'll tr we've got a little bit of time, so I'll, I'll go into a, just a few items um, about, your, about your domain name. Mine is genepoolthebook.com, yeah. right? So that makes it quite easy. So do, I recommend that. Use your book title, and it's very simple for people to remember. Um, there's a couple of things that you want to create when you're marketing your piece, which is a one sheet, mm -hmm. right? And there's mine is back there for you to see. It's a very simple, doc. this is also uh, done in a PDF, so you send it out digitally for the most part, but mm -hmm. also you can have it printed out. But your book cover, uh, a little synopsis, and then some more details, and all the information about the book, including the, the ISBN number, and where people can go to get it, because this is going to go to your reviewer. Once you engage with the reviewer and the process is basically identifying them. There's a number of guides out there that will give you lists of these people. You send them an email and say, hey, I'd like you to review my book and I've attached a one sheet, right? Because that's what they're going to want to see and then they'll come back and say, yes, um, I'm interested in reviewing your book and they'll do it. So you want to make sure you create that. Planning is critical to your marketing process, as Grace has already said. Mm -hmm. I do a work back schedule. Okay, when's my book going to be published? Because you want to set a deadline for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then what are all the tasks that I need to complete? And then how do I m make sure I get back to where I am? And Okay, I can get it all done, Great. right? So everything that you want to do from all your promotion activities, um, which are basically your website, your PR outreach, you know, various kinds of marketing, social media, one thing about social media, I would not get hung up on. It is great. If you can do a post every week or every other week, that's mm -hmm. fantastic. Most of us don't have the time. Mm -hmm. so you don't need to do that. But get that website up there and get at least initially when you get the book out, have, write up 10 or 12 interesting posts and then spin them out over the next 10 weeks because that's when you're going to get your, the bulk of your sales and that will engage people. If you're fortunate enough to build a big audience, then you can keep going and that'll be, that'll be quite helpful. Um, the one other thing uh, I mentioned is promotion, constant promotion. So, and there are very simple ways to do it. So one example of what I did was KQED, the local public radio station here, has a, has a uh, show called Perspectives, where they invite outside writers. So my book deals with uh, the future of biotechnology and how we're all going to live forever in that future. And so I wrote a, a piece called The End of Death, which was tied into my book. Now, you can't promote your book directly. Mm -hmm. But what they do is they say Bob Finlayson, who is the author of Gene Pool, you know, Unnatural Selection, and then people listen to that and they hear that, plus they hear GenePoolTheBook.com at the end, and they go to your, your website, which should have a free download for the first chapter of your book, mm -hmm. and also a link to where they can purchase it. Mm -hmm. So there's a, oh, and one last little tip, a good thing to carry with you at all times is to create yourself an author book, uh, an author business card, which I left at, for everyone on your chair, right? So this is how, because when, when in every conversation, you want to say, Alicia, so nice to meet you. Yes. You know, I wrote this book you might be interested in. And this business card has, of course, my name, and it's got all the website information. And on the back, there's QR codes. So with my phone, I can scan in that code, go directly to Amazon, and purchase the book instantly, right? So no one's got, how do I get that book? It's right there. Yeah. So this is a very simple and it's very inexpensive. It's a, just a simple marketing tool. Hand it out to all your friends, hand it out to everybody you meet. So with that, That's a great point. So, anyway, great questions, point. please. Um, I've had uh, two books published, one with a vanity press, which is a, which is a rip off. And then I had another one published with a small press. And, um, uh, I know that like they they both have a lot of books to market like since they like work with a lot of authors so basically I'm trying to decide if the next one I'm writing if it would be um, this is the only route I haven't tried the indie publishing I was trying to figure out if it would be like better or would it be better to go with a small publisher I mean like you guys like did you go with like a pub try to go with a publisher first or did you go straight to indie publishing with your books I tried to go with I to get it published traditionally 
Um, but I was I wanted to say something else, and then I went to indie publishing. Um, the nice thing with either of these Ingram Spark or Create Space is they have these what are called expanded distribution programs that you can get into. So um, so you can get your book in databases that librarians and book buy booksellers are going to use. So if if you solicit these places to buy your book, um, then it, it's really you make it a lot easier for them to go in and and just find your um, book in their database and buy it. You make it a lot easier for them to purchase. And I highly advise, I know it's harder for indie authors to get into libraries and bookstores, but I highly advise people to do that, to solicit librarians and book buyers to, to get their book there, because this is really what's gonna really increase your exposure so much. Somebody might walk into a bookstore in Arkansas or wherever and see a copy of your book, and it's not going to happen if y y you just kind of keep yourself in this. It it's something to really help your exposure. Well, one of the things about <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. one of the things about publishing as an indie author is something that's very simple to remember. It's called seventy percent, right? So when you publish as an indie, indie, indie mm. author, you get seventy percent of the 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 service takes 30% as a royalty, right? When you go with a traditional publisher, you're going to get 12%, wow. right? So it's a big, big difference. So as, an, as a new author, as you're building your reputation, going the indie route can help you, and you can collect much more, unless you're very fortunate to get with a good publisher mm -hmm. who also promotes you. Because by the mm -hmm. way, that's the other thing that happens is when you get, when a big pub or any publisher takes on your book, you have to do all the promotion and bear all the expense, and you still only get the 12%. Yes. Did that kind of answer? Oh, well, sorry, Alicia, do you have anything to add? Well, I just actually want to ask you, as a librarian, would you recommend <laughs> authors, for example, a pay to have a booth at the annual, at the American Library Association's annual state or national things? Would you recommend mm -hmm. having a booth and saying, hey, all these thousands of librarians are coming here, please order it and have something available or not really? That's a great idea, but I did have my book in combined, um, through a program called Combined Book Expo. I had my book in American Book Expo in New York in Javits Center. And that's the biggest book, um, in, that's the biggest show of the book industry in the country of the year, much bigger than ALA. Um, and I got maybe one person that wrote to me, you know, a promoter, a publicist that wrote to me that, with interest. So I didn't, it wasn't a whole, whole lot of money, but if you are going to do it that way, um, just because I had a misfortune, what I'd recommend is doing this combined book expo, because through that, you don't actually have to pay for all the traveling expenses. Mm -hmm. You don't actually have to be there. You get your book, like I didn't go to New York. I just had my book in this expo with a lot of other books. And, you know, it's a pretty, it was like $300. So it's, it's not bad in terms of pricing. Um, and ALA, American Library Association, is going to have a similar, um, you could do ALA through Combined Book Expo. Okay, great to know. And so I'm a, I'm a fan of going that route as opposed to, I mean, who has like thousands of dollars to spend for traveling and sure. so on, you know. So yeah, look it up. Uh, just as I said, combinedbookexpo.com. <clears throat> I have a question. Do you think that the indie writers are going to are they threatening the regular publishing industry? Are these are these trying to lose clients because everybody's going indie? And what are they going to do to get us back? Because I've been rejected. Yeah, I'm dying to. Be <laughs> <laughs> I am passionate about being an indie author. Um, we, we we used to talk about the big six publishers in New York, which are really now at the big four with mm -hmm. um, consolidation. I think w the writing is on the wall in the sense that we've seen um, successful authors like Hugh Howey, who does a science fiction series called Wool, mm -hmm. very well reviewed by the New York Times. He did something really unprecedented very recently. He was able to negotiate with a traditional publisher to handle his print books, but he got to keep his digital rights. And that is that is a, a huge development. The big the, you know, the big publishers in New York would never have said that. We control everything. That's their motto, and I understand that's the model they work from. But with respect to what they offer, it is becoming outdated. There used to be a, a stigma of 
self-publishing or independent publishing, we're really seeing that erode. And I, I don't believe I'm being a Pollyanna about that. We're seeing um, J.K. Rowling has now, she does all the e-books. She, because basically your book today is always going to be in a file, in an electronic file. Why wouldn't she assume rights and distribution of profits for her Harry Potter e-book series? And then... Stephen King, also uh, the novelist Jackie Collins. Is, she's right, she's done 30 Collins. titles. Who, now she does self-publishing. She buys in the experts as she needs them. She retains control of her voice, her creativity, has the final say on her cover design, all manner of things. And she's keeping the profits as a result. So I do believe it's... It's going. Well, they really they've undergone a, a lot of change, a lot of change. And I, I was going to say, as a book buyer, um, the database that I work in, I, I see a lot of publisher out of business and can't be located, and um, mm. you know, just a lot of indications that publishers are dying by the you know by the day. Just. I, and there's a lot of factors. I don't think it's, I don't really know, that it, I don't think it's indie publishers as much as just the economy in general. And, but there's, there's many factors, but they are really suffering. And um, so, it, yeah. Well, you know, I don't That's want to I bash noticed. a traditional publishing either. If you can get a book deal, I will please let me know. I'm glad to see that go down. I'm sorry? I've been rejected by all of them, so I'm glad to see <laughs> <laughs> You're my heroes. <laughs> well, I also notice them going for whatever they think is going to sell. And so I encourage people not to write from your heart and from something, from what you're truly passionate about, and not to jump on any bandwagons. Because just in my. You know, I read hundreds of reviews, uh, book reviews through many sources, and I, you know, it, it looks to me like a lot of publishers are standing behind and selecting books that they think are going to sell mm -hmm. over a book that they think is a good quality and um, that is something, they you know, yeah. They're not taking risk. And but, they're you know, doing a lot of bandwagons, too. But I also respect, you know, they're there yeah. to make a profit, and yeah. they need to yeah. make an assessment of all the things that mm -hmm. enter the slush pile, what's going to work. So I don't, I don't want to bash traditional mm -hmm. publishing. I think, you know, it, it has worked for a long time. If any of you get a book publishing, uh, traditional mm -hmm. publishing deal, please call me. I will raise my glass to you. <laughs> but the beauty now is that independent publishing democratises writing. You can have your voice heard in whatever platform you want, whether to fulfil a dream, to be an author, to build your credentials in your field. There are so many motives for doing it. And so, I, you know, we're just going through a lot of change in, in the publishing landscape. And that's a good thing for all of us because we get more options. Exactly right. So well put. <laughs> oh, Hi. I have published a children's book. This is a cover I happen to have with me. Oh. I didn't even know I was going to be here with you. Congratulations. <laughs> I, I, I think I have so many ideas that I don't stop and market. And uh, also I'm having trouble moving from writing to publishing the stuff I'm working on now. And I know it's personal self-discipline I have to somehow come up with, but I was hoping you might have some suggestions. In terms of time management? Oh, uh, no. Is that what it is? is that I, I think I know what you're talking about, but if, you, if I incorrect, let me know. But it is, it's really been challenging for me to simultaneously write creatively and market and be the business person. So I have to kind of do my writing and be in my creative mode, my artistic mode. And when I'm done and I've edited it and I've gone through my manuscript and you know after it's published, then I go into the CEO mode. But I can't, I personally can't be in both modes simultaneously because it's it's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> I just is that kind of what you were yeah. saying? Yeah, well, I just want to put it so in So I think kind of maybe what might work for you is what worked for me is kind of. Um, separating these things and saying, okay, now I'm going to write, I'm going to be creative, I'm not going to worry about marketing or any of that practical stuff. I might do a blog post, you know, once a week and, and uh, put it out on social media, but that's it. But um, I, after, after that and after the publishing I'm, and the editing process, I go into the marketing mode. And that seems to have worked pretty well for me. I don't have nearly as much fun with the marketing 
as the creative process. I mean, I'm in it mostly to be in that process because I love it so much. But I, you know, it's a necessary part of it. And um, I did do a video for YouTube mm -hmm. for children and seeing Wonder's daughter singing on Mr. Rogers' song is wonderful. But but nobody knows about it. I had a right. public, uh, publicist for a while, but that's fifteen hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Publicists are very expensive and not something that I would highly recommend because it's really a gamble that you take. Well, no one can guarantee yeah. the results. They can't really guarantee yes. the results and they cost thousands. What do you think but about YouTube uh, publishing, uh, promoting your stuff on YouTube? This is a big new area is author videos, uh -huh. right? So if you go to like the, the sites for some of the very well-known authors, you'll often see a very well-produced video on there. So it, it's being used a lot, but then of mm -hmm. course you have to promote the video as a tool um, to get that out, uh, uh, put it in front of the right audience. And there are ways to do that, um, but it, it's very time intensive. It's sending it out to a lot, thousands of mm -hmm. sites, sending the link out to thousands of sites and saying, uh, you know, this is a video about this book, we'd love you to, you know, and you write a little post for them that they can post on their, on their news site. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how, and especially if it's a particular topic that you're engaged in, then find the, the blogs that care about that topic and they'll often post the video and in the video it should be something interesting that adds value to whoever's watching it. Mm -hmm. And then at the end is where you say, and this book is available you know, to, at this website, and the video can actually be clickable mm -hmm. yeah. so that they can get right to it. And add it to your e-signature on your, all your outgoing emails. Mm -hmm. Put everything, your book title, any awards, that you're a speaker, for example. I've got speaking engagements booked mm -hmm. from a lady at the gas company who just saw it and said, oh, well, my husband has a company with a speaker roster. Uh, you know, someone I would no, not normally be able to reach. So just make it easy for yeah. people to find you and get to know you. That connection, that human connection through your about page, through your author photo. We all just, we're humans. We're looking for something in common or something relatable. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. Yes. With regard to, to, to that, that point, like how, you, you know, you... I jotted down exclusivity limits your exposure. I'm just wondering like how for each of you do you determine what the success of your exposure is or, or like you know how do you evaluate that where you need to be working or how successful what your efforts are in terms of sort of the online reality? I mean, do you like Google Analytics or do you what, look at sales? I or? mean, there's a very simple analytic and that's just your sales, right? Mm -hmm. And then each of the sites that you're on gives you very detailed information, you know, day by day of what the sales look like. Um, so you can see, like if I spoke here, was there a sudden spike? Yes. And you can tie that directly to those activities. And you think you can tie it directly to oh, those things? Well, yeah, yeah. Unless, there, unless you're doing so many things where you don't know which one of them yeah. was mm -hmm. responsible for that. And it can come in a lag time too, but this is, we live in a digital age, right? People just want to go boom and they're done. So usually after whatever you've done, you're going to see almost an immediate spike and then it's going to drop off yes. and you know that it was successful. If there's no spike and it doesn't, and after several days nothing happens, then you know, well, that didn't work. Yes, and I, there, is a, sorry, sorry, there is a saying that, you know, that only half of all advertising works and no one knows which half. <laughs> so it is experimenting, isn't it? And mm -hmm. watching after you do a radio piece or a local television piece, watching that spike and monitoring activity on your site or in your Google Analytics afterwards, and you're just getting to know whether you've reached people or not. I'm sorry, I think I cut you off. No, no, well, I was just, with regard to that, like, how would you, you, you know, uh, weigh the distinction between your online presence and the presence of getting out there, speaking, going into bookstores, making yourself actually physically there? How do you think that, I mean, which, which Does it important. matter? Do you really do you really need to exist, or can you just? <laughs> you have to exist online. That is non-negotiable. And you want oh. to, as an author or a speaker, do you feel you want to be available 24/7 to anyone across the world to find you? Sorry. Did you mean exist physically? I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify your question. Well, or no, no. That's you... what I mean. Like, okay. the distinct, like, like, 
getting on a radio a interview virtually? program it, to me is almost like live. You know, it's mm -hmm. not quite the same as a post on Twitter or whatever. But like, you know, actually being present in readings or speaking engagements. I mean, do you? I guess it's more effort to do that. So is it is it worth that effort? Absolutely. 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 You're making a connection with potential readers and building a following. So. And I was just going to add my story about the man who sold 5,000 books in five years, yeah. which is, he probably exceeded many people who are published traditionally. And, you know, just going up to people. And this person was not tech savvy at all. <laughs> I don't even know if he has an email address, but he just goes up to people and he gives them, you know, his spiel. And um, he's selling the physical. He is. Yeah, if you're selling, it, yeah, but if you're not selling a physical book, that can be more difficult. But being that's true, and, and you can't be <laughs> everywhere, and that's mm -hmm. that's a hard road to go down. So you want right. to try to, uh, you want to look at a division of, okay, how many times can I personally go to something like this, mm -hmm. versus what I'm, what energy I'm going to put online. I mean, right. your online yes. energy should be. I w my personal view is, you should be probably in the 80-20 range, 80% 80 mm -hmm. online because it's just so effective and it's, it's convenient. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And 20% of being very selective about what you do and where you go. But then also always be willing to hand that card out. Mm -hmm. And every, whenever I'm talking to someone, I always work into the conversation that I wrote this book, <laughs> you know, and, and I see what their reaction is. And they're like, oh, that's so interesting. I love science fiction. I'm like, well, here, mm -hmm. you know, and buy the book, please. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but that's hand selling on a one by one basis. So, you know, that can be helpful, but really the digital is, is where you're going to get the biggest exposure. Yes. And the other thing I wanted to add is um, your mailing list is another indicator. Um, so mm -hmm. getting people to sign up for your mailing list, another way of uh, judging how well you're doing in terms of um, your presence and your... You mean just the vast number of the people on your mailing yeah, list so or you the were response saying there from? How, exactly, like how to judge your success. So that would be another way of, you know, if you get so many people signed up for your mailing list, you're doing pretty well. And that's they're really important, again. I, I, it may have been Grace who said this, uh -huh. that you, you are publishing a revised version of your book? I you published said? the revised version. But yeah. is it, is it, uh, are the words different or just the format? Oh, I just, I grammatically, I just went, the... Because um, I got a revised question. question actually, about. both, words and format. Um, <laughs> because I'm, I, well, not, it's in paperback format and ebook formats, but um, it's a different printer. So I published this book, on, which I showed you, on mm -hmm. Sounds of Movie in the interviews in 96. Mm -hmm. I was very focused on selling it to college film courses, mm -hmm. got reviews in all major trade magazines, and mm -hmm. really Fantastic. sold the book with very, except for the stress of calling the editor and saying, yeah. I can't send you a book unless mm -hmm. you're going to review it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very effective. So I've now revised it somewhat, only mm -hmm. in that I've added the credits of uh, these 15 major sound mixers mm. who've made hundreds of movies since I published this book in 96. Mm -hmm. So now, and it took me a long time to do this, now that's done. And I am I have a list of about a thousand educators and all, uh, you know, actually, um, um, shit, I'm sorry. What's this book name? Sounds of Movies, I'll show you. I'm going to buy it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question is, how do you, and I've heard that if you're coming, um, Okay, so we have about two minutes. How do you promote, how do you promote a revision <laughs> of a book, uh, which, which was substantially already published? I'm hoping that there's an audience that'll still buy this book. Um, I just promoted the way I've been promoting the book all along. Yeah. So it was more for myself than anything. I just, so I, I just prefer this. Uh, there were things this, you wanted to change. Yeah, there were things I wanted to change. Exactly. But, uh, so I'm in, just in the revised version. Yes, and I just did it the same. You know, I didn't change anything in terms of uh, how I promoted it. Are the sales comparable at all with the original? Version? I think so, but again, I'm not so great at. I'm not as good as I should be at looking and, and seeing that, but that, um, I think they're said. I think they're pretty good. We all we all are. <laughs> I can get yeah. But I think, is there, okay, we, um, oh yes, and I wanted to remind you all that we'll be selling books after if you're interested, but I'm sorry, what question did you have? Have you ever sold an e-book in person? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. As in, so they take the card and click on it. Oh yeah, they'll, sometimes they'll d intentionally do it right in front of me. They want to say, oh, I definitely want to, and they want to show me that they did it. <laughs> so, so, and I'm like very happy to see it. <laughs> so. What is that little thing? It's, it's called a QR code. And you, you can go, um, if you just type in QR code into Google, you'll find the site where you can create it. Uh, and you, you just apply a link and... It generates the code for you. You take that artwork and then you apply. You know, you give that to your designer. And QR means quick response right. code. So they'll click on it and you'll go to um, Bob's page. So hopefully right my there. page. No. You're, you're hopefully your page and not someone else. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> I think that's thank all, you. right? Yes, you've all been wonderful. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. We have chocolates over here as well. Please grab some. That's very important.